This video is brought to you by Privacy.com. Stay until the end to see how Privacy.com lets you make purchases online without risking any of your personal information. What is going on, my fellow mythology nerds? My name is John Solo, and welcome to another episode of Mythology Explained. A few weeks ago, we talked about the goddess of the underworld, Persephone, her marriage to Hades, and some of the myths associated with her and her reign as queen of the underworld. So I thought we'd continue that trend and discuss the mythos of another popular goddess, Aphrodite. Now, I don't know about you, but before I started researching for this episode, I didn't know much about Aphrodite other than that she was the goddess of love and allegedly a total smoke show. But there were many moments during my research where I had to stop what I was doing, take a step back, and ask myself, what did I just read? I mean, there's adultery, murder, curses that make people smell terrible. Her story's got it all. We'll be diving into all that and more very shortly, but first I gotta ask that you show that like button some love, just like Aphrodite would want you to, and subscribe to have more messed up mythological content delivered to your sub box on a regular basis. So let's start with the basics. We all know that Aphrodite is the goddess of love and beauty, but it gets a little more specific than that. See, there were some Greeks who tried to differentiate between the two realms of love, platonic and romantic, saying there was a different Aphrodite for each one. Because I guess some people felt weird about the same goddess presiding over the love they had for their husbands and wives and their grandmas. Aphrodite Pandemos was the goddess of sexual desire and Aphrodite Ariana presided over platonic love, but it doesn't stop there. She was given several alternate nicknames to cover for all the dimensions of love. Smile loving, merciful, one who postpones old age, unholy, the dark one, and the killer of men. Obviously, those got pretty contradictory at the end, but depending on who or what it's for, love can be a different experience for everyone. As for her portrayal, that depends on the culture. Aphrodite was often shown as a beautiful woman with ideal measurements who was either nude or mostly nude. What's interesting though, is that version of her was more common in Roman mythology before finding its way to the Greeks. Originally, in Greek cities, like Sparta, Aphrodite was covered in armor from head to toe, kind of resembling Athena. This led to her being affiliated with Ares, the god of war. I've got a story about those two I think you're really going to like, by the way but that's coming later. Like many Greek gods, Aphrodite was worshiped and sacrificed to on a regular basis, but her main festival called Aphrodisia was celebrated once a year during the summer across all of Greece. And I just figured out why it's called an aphrodisiac. On such occasions, priests would purify the temple of Aphrodite Pandemos with the blood of a sacrificial dove, a bird often associated with the goddess. Next, the altars would be lathered in special oils and perfumes, then the statues of Aphrodite and Pitho, the goddess of persuasion and seduction, would be brought somewhere in the temple to be ritually bathed. I've got to imagine those statues would be heavy too. It says something about the dedication the Greeks had to their worship that they would put that much effort in just to give the gods statues a bath. But anyway, now that you know who Aphrodite is and what worship of her looked like, let's break down the goddess's story starting from the beginning. Now when I say beginning, I don't mean the beginning of time. I've done a video on that before. Today I'd rather start a little later, right after Zeus's father Kronos dethroned his father Uranus as king of the universe. As I'm sure you remember, because it's rather hard to forget, Kronos took the throne after cutting off his father's balls and throwing them in the ocean. After that, the Titans took over, and after that, the Olympians took over. But Aphrodite wasn't one of Zeus's siblings, so where did she come from? Well that depends on where you get your information from. According to Homer, she was the daughter of Zeus and Dione, the Titaness. But in what I'd say is the most popular version, she actually forms fully grown out of the sea foam that gathered around Uranus's dismembered members. By the time she showed up on Mount Olympus, Zeus and the Olympians had already taken over, and to no surprise, when those Olympians saw the beautiful Aphrodite, they all wanted her to themselves. In order to stop any conflict from breaking out between the gods, Zeus immediately assigned Aphrodite a husband, his son Hephaestus, the god of fire and craftsmanship, also known as the ugliest Olympian. Or at least that's one version of the story. In another, Hephaestus crafted a beautiful golden throne for his mother Hera that trapped her in place when she sat on it. Hephaestus said he would only let her go if she set up the marriage between him and Aphrodite, so she did. Regardless of what rendition you like more, Hephaestus was a much better spouse to Aphrodite than she was to him. In addition to endless adoration, he often showered her with divine gifts he made with his own godly craftsmanship, like a girdle that accentuated her, but his generosity wasn't enough. Aphrodite played her husband like a 
fool and had numerous affairs with all of the other gods except for Zeus and Hades. And in some versions, even Zeus, which is especially weird when you consider that he may have been her father. The most notable of these affairs was with Ares, the god of war, which might add some context to her association with him by the Romans. Now one afternoon, Helios, the god of the sun and watchman for gods and mortals alike, spotted these two going at it like rabbits and figured he should tell Hephaestus what's up. After receiving the news, the almighty craftsman fashioned a golden net that was woven so thin it was invisible even to the godly eye, and then set the trap above his bed. Then, the next time Aphrodite and Ares got busy, it fell on him, trapping him in place. And, as if that wasn't an embarrassing enough way to get caught, Hephaestus invited all the other Olympians over to laugh at the two lovers. Poseidon was one of the only gods who felt bad for them, so he paid Hephaestus to release them. The question of whether or not that actually ended the affair remains to be answered, though, because in total, Aphrodite had eight children with the god of war, and, you're reading that right, even some with the other gods. Yeah, Aphrodite's uterus was essentially an almighty clown car. Now I'm not one to slut shame, but like Tupac, Aphrodite got around. And because that godly D wasn't enough for her, on more than one occasion, she had relations with mortals. You guys already know about Adonis, the hunk of a man that her and Persephone fought over, which ultimately resulted in Persephone sending a wild boar to kill him after learning he preferred Aphrodite to her. But there was also Anchises, a handsome shepherd who lived in the city of Troy. See, Zeus was sick and tired of Aphrodite making gods fall in love with mortals, something she apparently enjoyed doing for fun. So to get back at her, he cursed her with an intense love for Anchises. One day she appears to the mortal, glowing and as radiant as ever, and right off the bat he asks if she's Aphrodite, but she lies and says she's mortal and a virgin. It doesn't take long for the goddess to convince Anchises to take her to a cave and make love to her, but right after they sleep together she reveals her divine form and he panics. Aphrodite tells him not to worry though, and she promises that she's going to bear him a noble son, but warns him to keep their affair quiet or Zeus will strike him with a lightning bolt. Well, not even a day later, Anchises got a little tipsy and braggadocious, and as we all know, loose lips sink ships. He bragged to his buddies about his recent love affair and was immediately struck by Zeus's lightning bolt, which, sidebar, probably added way more validity to the story in the eyes of those listening than if Zeus had just let him be. Well, Anchises wasn't killed by the blast, but he was blinded, and as a result, he wasn't able to watch the noble son Aphrodite had told him about, Aeneas, become the first true hero of Rome. Now don't get the wrong idea, not every story about Aphrodite involves a new lover of hers, but appropriately, they do all involve love. This next myth starts with the wedding of Achilles' parents, Peleus and Thetis. Every god and even some mortals were invited to attend the wedding, except for Eris, the goddess of disagreement, which I can honestly understand. The last thing you want when committing to someone for the rest of your life is for there to be any chance of disagreement. I do. I really, really do. I don't. And the goddess of disagreement being there would certainly increase the odds of that happening. Well, Eris didn't see it that way. She disagreed. Big surprise. And she showed up to the wedding unannounced and threw a golden apple among the goddesses that was inscribed with the words, for the fairest. Aphrodite, Athena, and Hera all saw themselves as the fairest, so they went to Zeus to settle the dispute. But my man was smart. He was like, uh-uh. That's bait. Instead, he passed the question off to the Trojan prince Paris, who was like, Zeus, what are you doing, man? I'm mortal. They can really f*** my day up if they want to. Still, the decision was left to the prince, and he had to choose who was the fairest of them all. And ladies, it's worth noting here that in a contest to see who is the most beautiful goddess, none of them are shown making the duck face or fake laughing in a sad attempt to get a candid picture. So maybe take that into consideration before making your next Instagram post. Anyway, Paris really couldn't make a decision because all of the goddesses were ideally beautiful, so they resorted to bribes. Hera offered him power all across Asia and Europe, Athena offered him fame, wisdom, and glory in battle, and Aphrodite offered him the most beautiful woman on earth. All tempting offers, but Paris went with door number three. He wanted a hot wife. The problem was that potential wife was Helen, who was already married to King Menelaus of Sparta, and this is what led to the Trojan War. Now, as much as I'd like to break down the events of that war and Aphrodite's involvement in it, I think that's a topic better suited for its own episode. But I do think it's worth noting that those goddesses who weren't chosen took it very personally, and as is typical for her character, Hera enacted a plan for revenge. One night, when Aphrodite was sleeping and pregnant with her son Priapus, Hera stealthily applied a potion to her stomach 
that guaranteed the child would be hideous. When Priapus was eventually born, Aphrodite was horrified to see he had a massive tongue, a pot belly, and how do I say this in an advertiser friendly way, a giant schlong that was always fully torqued except for when it needed to be. The goddess of beauty was so horrified with this monstrous creation of hers that she wanted nothing to do with him and abandoned him to die out in the wilderness. Fortunately for him, he was found by some local herdsmen who raised him as their own. I wonder if that's where they got the idea to have Hercules found by Alcmene and Amphitryon in the Disney movie. I mean, I'm sure it's not, but if it was, it would make me happier than I'd like to admit. Like most gods and goddesses, Aphrodite had a bit of a temper when she felt disrespected. So in this section, we're gonna talk about a few of the instances where that happened and the unique punishments that she dealt out in response. Just so you can get a sense of how touchy she was, we'll start with Glaucus, the son of Sisyphus. He was a chariot racer who fed his horses human flesh and wouldn't let them mate because doing so would hinder their speed. Aphrodite didn't like that they weren't allowed to get it on, so she struck the horses with a fit of madness in the middle of their next race, causing them to tear Glaucus limb from limb. A bit extreme if I do say so myself, though I do wish she would inflict that kind of punishment on any matadors that are still out there doing their thing. My favorite anger myth involves the curse of B.O. that I mentioned earlier. For reasons I'm not aware of, one day all of the women on the island of Lemnos decided they weren't going to sacrifice to Aphrodite anymore, and she didn't like that. Not one. Bit. To punish these broads for their insolence, she cursed them to stink so terribly that their husbands would no longer want to have sex with them. But of course, the men still wanted some action, so they got busy with their slave girls instead, which infuriated their wives. So much so that the women killed all of their husbands and slaves, so they were the only ones left on the island. That is, until some time later, when Jason and his Argonauts landed their boats there and, under Aphrodite's approval, repopulated the island with the remaining women, who at that point were in desperate need of some loving and they vowed to never again disrespect the goddess. In that solo fan will be the final myth we talk about today, but before I let you guys go, I gotta ask that you stick around and listen to a word from today's sponsor, Privacy.com. Now, as someone who is very online, I make more purchases on the internet than I do in stores. And while convenient, what sucks about that is that for every transaction, I have to fork over private information and just trust that the merchant will keep it safe. But what's great about Privacy.com is that keeping your information safe is their entire business model. And they do that by using military grade encryption and allowing you to create virtual credit cards that are exclusive to the individual stores all for free. Not only does that lower your chances of any ne'er-do-well stealing your credit card and using it wherever they want until they hit the limit, it also stops the businesses themselves from double charging you or upgrading your account without your knowledge. For example, my Hulu membership is $12 a month, so I just set a limit of $13 on my Hulu card, which I've already linked to my checking account, and I'll be notified if I get charged more than that for any reason. As you can see, the website itself is super easy to use, but the icing on the cake is you can install a Chrome extension that makes the process even smoother, generating a brand new card for you on the spot. As someone who's had his private information stolen on more than one occasion, privacy.com has relieved a lot of stress for me and they can do the same for you. Remember, the service is already free and as a member of the Solo fam, you can sign up at privacy.com slash John Solo and earn $5 to spend towards any online store you want. Yeah, they protect your private information and give you free money. It doesn't get much better than that. So tell me, Solo fam, what do you think about Aphrodite after what you learned today? Did you already know that she slept around, about her anger issues, or that she played a significant role in starting the Trojan War? Let me know in the comments down below. And when you're through with that, make sure to show that like button some love. Otherwise, Aphrodite is probably gonna make you stink forever. And subscribe to have messed up mythological content delivered to your sub box on a regular basis. And make sure to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to stay updated on what I'm up to between videos, offer suggestions for future content, or just say hello there. Until next time, everybody, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first. <laughs>